Buonasera, or good afternoon, wherever you are, uh, and welcome, welcome to Cultural Welfare, Art and Public Ar public Space. This is Paolo Granata. It's a great pleasure for me today to host uh, this uh, special panel and special event uh, of the Italian Association uh, of Canadian Studies uh, annual conference. And so it's a special event. We are live, uh, live on uh, Facebook, live on YouTube and Twitter. So I wanted to do a little bit of housekeeping before getting started uh, and engage you in a conversation. So we are uh, uh, live streaming. And so I wanted to share our, our uh, hashtag, which is culture welfare. If you are on Twitter, we are streaming on Twitter, thanks to the School of Cities uh, at the University of Toronto and Ravisha, our uh, social media manager for uh, uh, running out uh, this uh, special, special um, uh, communication uh, effort. And so feel free to share your, your, your comments, your tweets using the cultural welfare. And also, if you are on uh, uh, YouTube or Facebook, uh, you can actually um, put some comments, uh, share your questions, uh, share your good vibes, share your uh, reflections, and this is what we'll be able to see and to engage you in the conversation. So this is an open uh, panel, so we are live and very keen to involve you all wherever you are. We are uh, live in Toronto, live in Bologna, I'll say later a few words, and uh, we are very, very keen, again, looking forward to engaging you in uh, this uh, panel and conversation. And this is a special event, as you know, I wanted to mention our um, uh, sponsors uh, and uh, academic institutions uh, that are uh, that are uh, supporting uh, this uh, special event. I wanted to mention uh, a, a cluster of uh, partners uh, from Canada and Italy that are uh, uh, here uh, supporting the event. And in particular, the Italian Association of Canadian Studies, uh, the Italian Cultural Institute uh, here in Toronto, and uh, the Canadian Embassy in Italy supporting the event. And so uh, this, is an, um, this is another a great uh, achievement from Canada and Italy uh, um, together under the banner of uh, tradition and innovation, which is the annual theme of the Italian Association for Canadian Studies, the annual theme for the um, convention. Uh, I mentioned already, but I wanted to reiterate uh, our thank yous for uh, the uh, School of Cities at the University University of uh, Toronto and many other uh, cultural and academic institutions that are uh, supporting the event. And well, in a few minutes uh, after the housekeeping and warming up uh, segment, uh, I will actually, we will connect uh, with uh, Bologna. The University of Bologna is uh, hosting this year annual convention of the Italian Association of Canadian Studies. Uh, uh, our um, guest speakers will join us from Bologna and from Toronto to really celebrate the marriage between uh, uh, innovation and, and tradition uh, in, in, in this fashion way. And so uh, we are uh, almost ready. So it's, uh, it's uh, 10 or it's one and five minutes in, uh, in Toronto, almost uh, ready. I see you are connecting and, uh, and again, so feel free to share your comments. Uh, feel free if you are on YouTube or uh, Facebook. Uh, but even if you are mm, watching this uh, live stream on Twitter, we are live streaming on Twitter. So feel free to tweet, to share uh, your uh, comments. Uh, cultural welfare is our hashtag. And so we are, we are almost ready for an engaging conversation for panelists, uh, two cities, two countries gathering together to celebrate and reflect and explore, actually, the, uh, the meaning of the idea of cultural welfare. So we are really... We are really keen to explore uh, this, um, this concept. And so our panelists will uh, illuminate us and will uh, engage in a conversation and uh, good practices and sharing uh, uh, ideas on how really to uh, reflect on this very concept, reflect on the role of public and uh, public art, public space uh, to foster civic engagement, to foster a sustainable development, to build a more equitable, open, inclusive society. And so here we are, so excited. I think from Bologna, they are already, I see, I see our guests uh, from, uh, from Bologna 
ready to um, come into the into the um, live stream and because we are now okay i think it's time to uh, officially get started i wanted to get started i wanted to start up this special event and uh, i wanted to uh, acknowledge this land on which the university of toronto operates for thousands of years it has been the traditional land uh, of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. And with the land acknowledgement, uh, let's open up uh, the floor, uh, let's connect it to Bologna. Bologna chiama Toronto. Wow. Toronto. Hi, hi. Can you hear us well? Perfectly. Perfect. Thank, thank you, thank you. you. Hello, hello, hello. I see David, let's say Martin, Martin, Martin Stilio will well, be my co-host uh, for uh, tonight's or afternoon panel, depending on where you are. So Martin uh, Stilio from Bologna. How are you, Martin? And what's going on there in Bologna? Thank you. Everything is well and fine here. Uh, it's a little cold, so we have a kind of Canadian weather today in uh, in Bologna, and uh, particularly appropriate for uh, for the evening. Uh, I believe that uh, you may be interested in knowing uh, where are we now and uh, to introduce the place where we are, yes, uh, yes, the yes, Opificio yes. delle Acque and the institution that uh, owns it, uh, besides many other things. We have uh, here uh, tonight, of course, the president and director, actually, director, director of uh, the institution. Uh, let him uh, uh, speak and tell us all what he can about uh, where we are now. Professor, uh, Dr. Bolognesi. So good, good evening or good afternoon, depending on where you are, everybody. My name is Andrea Bolognesi, and as my surname reveals, I'm a citizen coming from this town, and I'm very proud to host this event here. Um, I recently became uh, the director of this institution, so I, I'm very happy to, to share with you a couple of information about the, the, the city where I was born and where I live and uh, on which in which this institution is based. Um, the name is Canali di Bologna, Canals of Bologna. You know, Bologna was founded several, several years ago. There were the Romans here and also population before the Romans came. And um, unlike other cities, Bologna was not founded on a major river. It was founded on a, on a stream, I would say, called Aposa, uh, which is a relatively short river uh, having a relatively small basin based on the hills of Bologna. So, I'm sorry. So, um, and so, let's say the flows of this river are intermittent. Uh, it's a kind of we call it technically ephemeral stream. So, uh, in in the years the city developed, uh, came into the medieval age where the city flourished and reached its final, let's say, uh, extension in terms of the historical city centre. And in order to provide water to the enlarged city centre, Two major infrastructures were created, one on the River Reno, which flows on the western side of the city, and one on the River Savena, which flows on the eastern side of the city. And uh, these two barrages, I would say, these two weirs, uh, allowed for flow diversion, and uh, two long channels, canals, were, were dug in order to bring water to the city. And uh, the main of these canals, which is the Canale di Reno, Reno Canal, is the one on which we are physically standing now. If, if we could dug a hole in this floor, uh, we would have the water flowing uh, from that channel today. 
And this canal was, was dug 800 years ago. So water came into the city in order to provide power, and that power uh, made the, let's say, was the, the main actor in the flourishment of the silk industry in Bologna. There was a time in the medieval age where uh, Bologna was known as a dominant, uh, had, sorry, a dominant position uh, as far as the silk industry was concerned. And uh, later on, this, of course, it involved uh, all the other milling activities, wheat, uh, flour, and so on. Um, it's quite peculiar to share with you this piece of information, and this is where I'm coming. I've, I've been talking about things happened several centuries ago, and this is a tradition. And the tradition has reached us up to now because, I, as I told you, that water is still flowing below our feet, under our feet, on the same channel dug 800 years ago. But, uh, and at the end of the 19th century, in the very early years of the, the, the 20th century, the, um, the mills that were here inside that were used for uh, leather manufacturing purposes, a couple of floors upstairs here, uh, were turned into relatively to that to that period modern turbines in order to generate electric power and that electric power uh, was connected to the very first x-ray room in the orthopedic hospital which is is located here uh, in the in the hill in the hills just uh, uh, immediately south of bologna for that time that was a huge innovation that was the progress, okay? But uh, in, a, in a bunch of years, uh, electric power became available for everybody. And so there was no longer the need for these turbines installed here. So what was innovation soon become, uh, became old fashioned and innovation became tradition. So I, I, I made use of this, let's say, short story about the transition between innovation and, uh, and, and, transi and tradition to say that uh, we are the perfect bond, the perfect, we represent the perfect bond, the perfect union between innovation and transition, which, on, on my opinion, they tend to follow up each other every time because what is known as innovative may soon become old-fashioned and then becomes tradition. So, uh, and Wonderful. 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 No, thank you. Well, thank, thank, you Andrea. thank you, Andrea. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, it's absolutely great to see how a natural source like water can be a source of innovation as well. I think uh, this is um, fantastic. Um, Martin. Uh, so the real, the real, as you see, Paolo, uh, we, when we are talking tradition in, uh, uh, in Italy, we are going back, far back. And if, and if we should uh, thank the, the people who, on which land we are standing now, we should uh, talk about the Etruscan and uh, <laughs> after the Roman. And, uh, but tradition, uh, like correctly said, uh, our host uh, uh, becomes in a, is easily transformed in innovation and innovation becomes tradition again. So it's a, a perfect uh, circular movement yeah. of and tonight uh, we will see what uh, this means for uh, the particular topic of, of the night that is the welfare of the people living in uh, in our uh, in our city uh, who should uh, start uh, paolo the the, the, the conversation uh, well, uh, well uh, we are, we are going to i'm going to present our special uh, guests both from bologna and uh, in, in toronto and then we have actually a very let's say uh, icebreaker question to again to break the ice and to start up the conversation so um, we have four special guests and panelists for uh, for tonight so i wanted to introduce um, them all so one at a time 
Let's start with Fabio Lanaldi. Fabio Lanaldi is an art, uh, is an art uh, historian, critic, and curator, specialized in phenomenology of styles, and PhD in contemporary history, art history at the University of Bologna. In 2014, she has been granted the habilitation to associate professor in uh, phenomenology of contemporary art. Since 2017, she has been a member of the board of directors of the Istituzione Bologna Musei. In 21, she created art. TV is a program, a TV program dedicated to video art uh, on match music. In 2015, she curated the program Pompi Pomilio Bloom Prize for Sky Art. She has been also responsible for the video art archive of Mambo, the Museum of Modern Art in Bologna. 29, 2011, 2013, she curated uh, uh, Biennale del Muro di Pinto, the Dots uh, Festival of uh, Graffiti, and from 2012 to 2016, she curated Frontier, La, La, La Linea dello Stile, a special project dedicated to writing and international street art. She authored uh, a high number of uh, essays, publications, critical texts. She also collaborates with uh, Flesh Art uh, uh, Magazine. I hope. Uh, I hope um, Fabiola is there, so welcome, uh, welcome Fabiola. Hi, Glad to see you. <laughs> Wonderful. Hello to everyone. Let me tell you, ciao Paolo. Ciao, <laughs> ciao, ciao, ciao. Because uh, Paolo introduced me in a very special way, but Paolo didn't tell you that uh, we are very good friends of each other. So it's very important not to underline this particular friendship that we share from a very long time ago. So uh, um, I start from uh, the particular situation that we divided between uh, Bologna and Toronto because uh, uh, Bologna is definitely uh, deep inside uh, its <coughs> tradition, but at the same time, uh, Bologna is very deep inside innovation well said. Uh, underground <laughs> cultural contest and uh, a very particularly attention to public uh, um, contest uh, problems uh, and uh, um, art situation outside the, in outdoor uh, experience uh, from the museum to the street in some way. Let me uh, remember you that Bologna uh, has been uh, the first European city to host uh, the first important international uh, exhibition about graffiti and street art in 1984 in the Galleria d'Arte Moderna. Uh, the exhibition, uh, the title of the exhibition was uh, Arte di Frontiera New York Graffiti. And at the time was the very first exhibition in Europe that tried to connect uh, the muralism in, uh, in a very illegal way, in some way, and uh, all the possibility at the time to, to host and to have that kind of artist inside the museum. So it was definitely a challenge. It was definitely the possibility to, to create a new share between uh, uh, the outdoor contest and the indoor contest. And I'm talking about the possibility for the contest to, to have in the museum this this particular artist that now we call them artists, but at the time they were just vandalism, you know, <laughs> and vandals in some way. I'm talking about the writer of New York, the, the very first generation. And uh, uh, starting from that time, very beginning of the 80s until now, Bologna has been uh, one of the pioneeristic city in, in Italy to, <coughs> to keep in touch and to control the connection between uh, this kind of movement. And at the same time, I would like to tell you that this is not just an avant-garde, it's a discipline in some way. And it's very interesting because uh, they were talking about public space in a different way, of course, especially in New York in the very beginning of the 70s. But when they came in, in Bologna and in Italy as well, they, they found, of course, a different context, a different situation. But at the same time, they tried to, to use uh, the skin of the city, 
in a different way. And they understand, I'm talking about Kefaren, Jean-Michel Basquiat, Crash, Days, and uh, I don't know if you know all these names, but I'm talking about uh, very important international artists that now are considered in a, in a sort of a new era of the painting, not just uh, uh, about writing and graffiti. I remember that graffiti is a, a very bad uh, way to, to, to treat that kind of art. Okay, so uh, Bologna um, defined in some way uh, the language, define in some way the possibility to, to treat uh, the world of the walls, especially the university and the revolution and the, the contest inside the university in the 70s and all the world we remember at the time. And at the same time, Bologna had the, the, the possibility to, to give to its citizen, but at the same time to the nation, the occasion to think about a new kind of language. So talking about public space now, after more than 40 years of discipline outside in an illegal way, and inside in a legal way, if we think about uh, uh, the, the, all the exhibition, it's, uh, it's very important, especially from Bologna. At the same time, I was thinking about Toronto, and Toronto had uh, a, a sort of manual of street art, because uh, um, Toronto has been, especially from the beginning of 2000, very uh, careful about uh, the questions of public space, the illegal and the legal one. So, uh, but Toronto uh, didn't have at the time, and I don't know if, uh, if they had now, like Bologna, uh, a public art found, like New York, for example, or like London or, or Paris. And uh, for Toronto and for Bologna as well, uh, has, has, has been the possibility to create a new connection without an, a big organization like public art found that control and support in some way this kind of uh, events uh, or curatorial programs in some way. And uh, for Bologna, during all this time, and especially for 2012 with this project that Paolo uh, just uh, announced in some way, so Frontier, the line of style, we decided to use the street in a different way. But we didn't talk about uh, uh, an outdoor museum. We didn't use the, the, the city in this way. We have our big important museum. I'm part of a board of institution of museum of Bologna and uh, I know very well that Bologna has a lot of big important museum. So Bologna doesn't need another museum. Bologna just needs the possibility to create new connection between indoor and outdoor discipline of art and culture, visual culture. So the front of the line of style was for us, because I was not alone, of course, because I, I was literally on the street, to, to not control, but to treat the walls of Bologna in a different way. And I know that Toronto tried to do the same in some um, part of the city. So uh, Frontier was uh, the, the, the updating of Art of Frontier in 1884. Uh, and it was for us the possibility to ask to the, to the artists of that period and to the new artists and the new generation to rethink about the occasion of this city. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, Bolognese talk about uh, the canal. No, I was thinking about the canal uh, next to Via Rivareno is a, a, a normal <laughs> street of Bologna, very uh, deep inside the, the center of Bologna. And we paint the, the two houses that control the, manical, the mechanical uh, structure, of the, that control the level of the water uh, of the canal uh, through uh, Via Rivareno and Via Lame. Uh, and we asked to, in this case, uh, uh, to ERA to, to, to have the possibility to paint the kind of, of, of wall. And that wall at the time was full of text and, uh, and just written in some way. So we decided to, to ask to two different artists, uh, French artists from the very first generation in the 80s and the, the first generation in Italy, Milan, in, in the very beginning of the 90s, to use the kind of the uh, walls in a particular way to talk about language, to talk about style, 
and to rethink about the possibility to create new connection. Of course, we are talking about public space, so it's very hard and difficult to use the public space when the citizen treat and think about the public space sometimes in different ways. So we try to, to do a sort of reunion, a sort of a talk, uh, especially with the, uh, the palace, the building where we try to, to, to paint. And we decided to explain to the citizen that in this case, they didn't do a participation part. They, 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 they were not able to be part in authorial position because we were the art critic and the curators and we were and we want to have the possibility to invite this uh, these artists but at the same time we try to uh, give them the possibility to rethink about their space in a different way so frontier has been uh, uh, realized in some way from 2012 and 2014 with the, the support of the major of the city. But in 2016, we decided to, to stop. Uh, but this is another story <laughs> because Bologna, unfortunately, Bologna has a lot of big, uh, important, good and bad events. And in this case, uh, we have just one big event in 2016. It was the possibility for this uh, important street artist called Blue to cancel all his murals uh, created in Bologna starting from 1999 until uh, uh, the end of the first decade of 2000 because it was an, um, uh, against uh, an exhibition. And, and, that, and that's because I, I tried to say at the very beginning that uh, the museum has to treat, of course, uh, um, the discipline of writing and street art, but not involving inside uh, different kind of walls inside the exhibition. The exhibition can be a documentation. The exhibition can be the possibility to think about the, the paradoxes that can create this kind of public situation. But it's very hard to put inside the museum uh, stuff created from the outside discipline. Different if we have a painting or sculpture, but you know very well that the, all the artists that use the public space are not so deep inside the painting and the sculpture. They want the, mur the mural, they want the walls, they need to, to have a big space and to create a connection with the citizen. Okay. Maybe we can go um, on uh, about this because uh, you have been mentioning the, the skin of the city yeah. <laughs> and we may want to know more also about the entrails of the city. In this case, uh, would be the opposition between uh, painting and sculpture. Uh, Paolo, shall yeah, we yeah. mix uh, down, like you said? Uh, uh, we, the, 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 definitely, the, definitely, uh, definitely. To keep the event uh, conversational and to foster the pleasure and uh, of dialogue, so um, Fabiola, uh, we will uh, well keep uh, listening your your stories and the, the way you have been uh, able to really foster public participation in the city of uh, Bologna. So uh, I'll, we will be back to you for a second merry-go-round because I wanted to actually uh, introduce our second guest uh, from Bologna and then finally. Uh, from um, uh, from Toronto. So we'll uh, I will uh, just present our next uh, guest from uh, from Bologna and then Toronto, and then we again dive into the conversation conversation to explore to share good practices uh, as uh, just, uh, Fabiola just uh, just did. And our second uh, our second uh, special guest from uh, from Bologna is the is Roberto Grandi. Roberto Grandi is the director of the Master in Digital Marketing and Communication at Bologna Business School at the University of Bologna. And from 2017 to 2021, he was president of Istituzione Bologna Musei. From 2000 to 29, he was a vice rector for international relations at the University of Bologna. 96 99 he was deputy mayor for culture municipality of bologna and he taught uh, mass communication and cultural processes at the uh, university of bologna 
from 1972 to 2016, I took uh, one of his, his courses. And in uh, his research, and then um, a number of publications, it has uh, analyzed the potential of the use of mass media and public political uh, and marketing communication in the fields of uh, fashion and city branding. He has spent uh, long periods of research and teaching abroad, in particular, Annenberg School of Communication, University of Pennsylvania, Stanford University, Brown University, US, and Toynji University in Shanghai. And it's a great pleasure to well, uh, welcome into this conversation uh, Roberto Grandi. Hello, Roberto, how are you? Hello, Paolo, how are you? I'm great, I'm, I'm great, great. I'm great. great to see you, you as, as again. again. Uh, you, looks, you look still very young. <laughs> What's going on in Toronto? <laughs> Well, it's, well, it's quite cold, and so I think cold uh, helps uh, keeping us uh, younger than usual. Uh, that's my answer. Marshall, uh, Marshall, behind you, so we have to be careful yeah. what we are saying tonight. <laughs> definitely, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, the movie yeah, is yeah, yeah, yeah. so I, I have Marshall, Marshall right here. Right here. It's, needed. it's needed. So I, I yeah, sure. Like <laughs> All right, thank All right. you, Robert. Thank, thank you very much. much. For, uh, for um, well, start, starting up the discussion, let me introduce our guests from Toronto and then we dive all together into the conversation uh, with uh, the first uh, ice-breaking uh, ice question. And so it's now time to uh, finally introduce our uh, guests from uh, Toronto. So the table is set eventually and then we start up the conversation. So next, uh, next um, special guest and the first from Toronto is Sarah Dunn. Diamond. Sara Diamond holds undergraduate degrees in history and communications, master degree in media art, and a PhD in computer science. From 25 to 2015, she was president of OCAD University, the University of Imagination, where she is now president emerita. What a nice motto, the, the University of Imagination. And she created the Banff New Media Institute, an international think tank, a research and production center at the Banff Center in Alberta, Canada. Currently, she is a co-chair of Toronto's Artworks TO, the Year of Public Art 2029, and um, Nuit Blanche in Toronto. With um, Dan Silver, she authored the Rethinking Public Art in Toronto, a study that initiated the new public art policy and the year of public art here in Toronto. Uh, she's an expert uh, panelist with the Canadian Center for the Purpose of Con Corporation and Associate Consultant and uh, a thought leader with the Lord Cultural Services. Recognitions include Order of Canada, Order of Ontario, Doctor of Science Honoris Causa from uh, Simon Fraser University in 2020, the 2020 Exceptional uh, Women of Excellence from the Women's uh, Economic Forum, two Media Pioneer Awards, uh, inspiring 50 Advanced of Diversity in STEM, and the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal for significant contributions to Canada. And uh, it's uh, definitely a great honor, a great pleasure to welcome into the cultural welfare panel discussion, Sara Diamond. Hello, Sara, how are you? Hi, Paolo, and, and uh, hello, Bologna. Bologna, it's so <laughs> fantastic to, um, to share this event with you. Do you want me to make my remarks or are you going to introduce all of us? Uh, yeah, no, why not? Uh, introduce your remarks briefly because uh, eventually after I'm going to introduce our uh, fourth Dan Silver, our next guest. So what's your uh, first take uh, uh, opening remarks for uh, your participation here today? Well, you know, you asked us to, um, you know, really um, think through the question of, um, uh, you know, really what is welfare? a kind of new integrated model for promoting the well-being and health of individuals and communities through practices based on the visual and performing arts and on cultural heritage. Um, so my approach is a multi-dimensional approach. And um, I wanted to start the conversation perhaps more literally, you know, thinking about physical and mental health, which is so relevant in the time of COVID-19. And I think what we've seen is a really increased interest, research and focus 
on the ways that engagement with the arts leads to better health. And I think this theme of tradition and innovation is so relevant to that because uh, a lot of this is about mental health and a sense of identity and place in a very complex time. And, uh, you know, Europe has played a very important role here. The World Health Organization's uh, uh, European Union Intersectional Action uh, in the Arts, Health and Wellbeing uh, Initiative, which um, launched in 2019 before COVID, interestingly, um, was founded on a, a very solid piece of research. It was um, uh, wow. essentially a, a, a scoping review that looked at 3,000 publications, which is significant global uh, publications that looked at the role of uh, the arts and culture in health and well-being. And uh, that research really saw a number of different dimensions, you know, some from participation in arts and culture, some from simply being an audience member, but also really looked at the role of arts and culture um, in promoting um, best health practices in, in mental health, in sexual wellness, uh, for example, and, and uh, HIV prevention. And certainly I think we've seen that in the context of COVID-19 where uh, arts and culture has played a very, very important role. Uh, there's a couple of really uh, coherent, important reports in the Canadian context by a consultancy called Hills uh, Strategy. And uh, Canada collects census data on a sort of six or seven year cycle. And it's a very interesting set of data that's deep data. It, it uh, asks people um, about their lives and their practices. And of course it's survey data. So it's what people say they do. Um, but people who are involved in the arts, so these are people who are essentially audience members, to some extent practitioners, uh, self-reported much better mental health, physical health, they volunteer more. Uh, they have a stronger sense of belonging. They have a sense of discovery about the world and about new things. And they're more empathetic with others. So, um, you know, I don't know. I, you know, I, I know that uh, you wanted us to kind of give, you know, a bit of a, a beginning. So for me, this is a very important dimension of this. Uh, I'm on the board. I actually chair the research um, advisory committee for Baycrest Um Health Sciences, which is a very, very important brain research center that focuses on aging. It's also a long-term care home. And um, that, in, that institution is very involved with neuroscience um, research and really looking at um, the ability uh, of the arts and engagement with the arts to build our neural circuits and our neuroendocrine markers and uh, actually help us uh, in many ways to keep our brains nimble and, and, and engaged. So um, there's a whole scientific uh, research piece here. The European, Un the European um, report, uh, you know, World Health Organization really emphasizes interdisciplinary collaboration in looking at the ways that um, health and the arts can help with welfare. So I, I've defined welfare in a narrow context here. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about it in a broader context, which is the sense that culture brings healthier, more resilient communities. And uh, I co-authored a report that's called Culture Creates Bonds with my um, uh, compatriot a researcher at OKU, Dr. Aaliyah Weston, who works a lot in uh, the Pan-African context in a number of countries there. And um, I'd like to talk, I'd like to come back to that and talk about this, because this is really about how culture creates bonds within communities builds resilience, um, but also creates better mental health. Um, so a kind of collective sense of health and well-being or welfare, as we'd like to define it. So um, I'm going to pause, um, but I would like to come back to this. And then when you ask us later on, I'm going to talk about the work that Dan and I did in terms of definitely, the art. Definitely. We, look, uh, we look forward to it. So thank you already for providing this um, um, well introduction and your take on this, pointing out uh, well-being and health uh, as a strategic values for the interconnection between arts and, and the, the, the urban life and in general 
of the human life. So this is absolutely great. And I'm going to actually introduce your co-author fellow for uh, that um, uh, important paper in the city of Toronto, Rethinking Public Art in Toronto. And so I'm going to introduce Dan uh, Silver and I'll be back to you later, uh, Sara. So we dive into your uh, best practices, good practices and your experiences uh, and to share with us. And so I'll be back to you shortly. Thank you, Sara. Thank you very much. And, um, and yes, Dan, Dan uh, Silver, uh, our final uh, next uh, guest, uh, is a professor of sociology at the University of Toronto. His research areas are uh, social theory, cities, culture, cultural policy. He's the co-editor of the politics of urban cultural policy and author of the Scenescapes, how qualities of place shape social life. Dan Silver was the recipient of the 2013 Theory Prize, the 2017 Consumers and Consumption Section Distinguished Scholarly Publication Award with Christy O'Neill and received an honorable uh, mention for the 2015 Junior Theorist Award with Christy O'Neill, all from the American Sociological Association. His current uh, research examines uh, the, the role of arts and culture in city politics, economics, residential uh, partners, uh, the enduring political orders of cities, uh, the use of diagrams and figures uh, in uh, social theory, the evolution of urban uh, forms, the meaning of receptions uh, of uh, Georg Simmel's ideas, uh, fortunately, and the definition of uh, evolution and classics and canons in sociological theory. Silver is also a core participant in the Scenes Project and the Urban Genome Project. He was an uh, editor and co-author of reports uh, of the cultural sectors in Toronto and Chicago from the ground up, growing to Toronto's creative sector, redefining public art in Toronto and Chicago, Music City, and is a fellow like me. So we are fellow fellow in the School of Cities, which is uh, supporting this event uh, today. So uh, hi to all fellows of the School of Cities at the University of Toronto and welcome Dan Silver into the conversation. Uh, hello, hello, Dan. How are you? Hello, Paolo. Great to be here with everybody. Um, Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'll um, I'll, I'll give you the um, I'll give you the word to start up the conversation already on uh, cultural welfare. Your take on the definition of cultural welfare, and then after you will be we will be back to Bologna to see how we can integrate all those ideas and maybe explore those ideas uh, through the lens of uh, best practices and projects and examples. So then, what's your what's your uh, take on uh, um, the very definition of the cultural uh, cultural welfare. So we, I think, we sh I shared already that definition provided by the uh, European Union, and um, and that's uh, and they, it's, it's it's the cultural agenda that released in uh, 2018. That's the <laughs> definition we started up the conversation. What's your take on cultural welfare? Yeah, thanks. So I, I'm going to say something about that in one second. But listening to our colleagues over there in Bologna talk about the city of Bologna, I thought I should say a little bit about the city of Toronto and its particular history with respect to culture and innovation. And then I'll come to the more kind of abstract question of uh, cultural welfare. Uh, and I'll put on my social theorist hat for that before I come back to my policy practitioner hat when we get to best practices and so on. Uh, just I just thought I'd share with others a little bit about Toronto because I think it's interesting and it helps us to think about these issues. Um, when I start to think about the history of sort of cultural uh, culture in Toronto, arts and culture and cultural policy, I like to start with this quote that I always laugh at from Ernest Hemingway, who I don't know if you, uh, you may know was a... Um, a columnist at the Toronto Star, the main local newspaper here in Toronto, way back in the early 20th century. And he um, he wrote a column there and he would go in Toronto and he would move back and forth between Toronto and Paris. And he was quoted one time at, when he had to leave Paris and come to Toronto as saying, oh, how I, leave, how, how I hate to leave Paris, city of lights for Toronto, city of churches. Right. And uh, and that was then. But now the situation has really changed. Uh, I did a project and we counted up the number of churches in the city of Toronto and compared it to the number of holistic health centers, uh, acupuncture studios, various kinds of arts activities, and those outnumbered churches by a long shot. In the past, uh, starting around 2000, if we go to the mid-2010s, things like uh, music publishing, record production, 
performing arts organizations, they've increased by 50 to 75%. Interior designers, musical theaters, dance companies have more than doubled, sometimes even tripling over that period. Much of that change and that transformation from the day of Hemingway <laughs> up to now was driven by massive waves of immigration starting in the 50s and 60s, uh, often from Southern and Eastern Europe, Europe, Europe. Before that, you couldn't get a cappuccino <laughs> here in Toronto, thanks to many immigrants coming uh, from Italy and elsewhere. Now you can get great cappuccino all over. Starting in the 80s and 90s, we saw immigration uh, coming from East Asia, South Asia, Caribbean, Africa, and the Middle East. And all of that has enriched uh, Toronto to be one of the most dynamic multicultural cities in the world, if not the most, which in which all of these different traditions combine in some way or, or another to create a kind of a center of innovation. And that takes me to how I think about the, um, the sort of general definition of cultural welfare. I like to think about that in a very literal way, the way Sarah started to do. I think we're on the same wavelength there. When we think about faring well, doing well, and we can think about that, I think, in two ways. One, we can think about the question of what does it mean for culture to do well? That is, what does it mean for the domain of culture, whatever that is, to exhibit growth, development, and dynamism? And we can think about how whatever that is relates back to other aspects of our lives in which we would like to do well, health being one very important one, and there are others. So on that first part, when I think about what does it mean for the domain of culture to do well, um, I put my social theorist hat on, and I'm very inspired by the work of uh, the great social theorist, late 20th century Daniel Bell, who wrote The Coming of Post-Industrial Society, uh, uh, Cultural Contradictions of Capitalism, among, other, among others. And uh, what Bell invited us to do is to think about what is the nature of growth and development in the cultural sphere? And to do that, we can compare it to what we see, uh, what, what, what the meaning of progress is in the economic or, or technological sphere, where we often sort of begin to think about this. And it's very different. In technology, let's say we're talking about black and white television, and we compare that now to the large flat screen color TV that we can get. It would be irrational if you wanted to watch, you know, a vibrant picture to keep with to, to stick with your little black and white tube TV. Uh, uh, if you have the option, you throw away the black and white TV and you take the large flat screen color TV. That pattern generates linear upward trajectory of progress and growth that characterizes technology and the economy. But culture is not like that. Culture is not like that. If somebody goes out and writes a really excellent play tomorrow, we wouldn't then say, ah, time to throw away the Shakespeare, <laughs> right? Uh, <clears throat> now, now, why is that? That's because the pattern of development and growth in the domain of culture is a, is a circle or maybe a sp upwardly <laughs> moving spiral. It has a recursive structure. That means that each time we do it, we're returning to the big questions in life that animate the human condition, love, death, joy, sin, redemption, and all of the rest. So one part of it is, always returning us to those questions. But that has to happen in a new and a different way for every time period and every um, every situation that we're in. And that other side of it is the innovation and dynamism side. And that side is driven by what Bell at least called syncretism or combination of many different things in new ways that allow the old questions to be asked ever again. That's what I mean when I think about sort of we're doing well on the cultural side. Do we have that rec recursion to the big questions over and over again, but in an open-ended way that allows for mixing and, and novelty? Now, then we then I think about well, what? How does that relate to um, the potentiality of contributing to welfare more broadly outside of the cultural domain? And and in that respect, uh, for me again, I'm inspired by social theorist and philosopher um, John Dewey, a great American pragmatist. And in John Dewey's philosophy of life and philosophy of action, um, the idea is that anything that we do, any activity that we do has uh, a, do a dimension, an aesthetic potential in it. That means that uh, it can be broken off before it reaches its fulfillment, or we can take it to its final culmination. And that, uh, that movement from a beginning to a middle to an end to a realization of something's full potential, that's the aesthetic and uh, cultural potential in everything that we do. And where we are able to achieve that, where we are able to have a greater sense of the intensification and the enrichment of experience that is a, in a, a potential in all activities that we do, and we create institutions and practices that allow that to happen again and again and again, that's where we see the integration of the cultural dimension into our everyday normal lives. And because that is marked by a sense of vitality and dynamism, a sense of enrichment and fulfillment, 
That is why it contributes to all sorts of other kinds of welfare. That's why economic growth, economic activity tends to be greater in the places where that kind of vitality and dynamism occurring. And that's also why community self-reflection of the sort that Sarah is talking about is uh, encouraged by the opportunities to reflect upon who we are and where we are going that only that those kinds of activities can, can create. There's much more to be said about that and how we do that in practice, but I think we'll get to that as we move along. You bet, you bet. And well, it's great to, your, your take on John Dewey is, and there's a kind of experiential involvement right, in the way we conceive uh, the city as, as a laboratory for fostering this kind of uh, experiential and I will say experimental uh, practices. And so, wonderful. Then I'll be, I'll be back to you soon. And I wanted to actually um, go back to Bologna and uh, we had a, already a first merry-go-round, but we didn't hear uh, yet the voice of Roberto uh, Grandi and, uh, and your take, Roberto, on the cultural welfare. So that was the first uh, um, icebreaker question. And so um, I'll, uh, I'll, pass, uh, I'll turn over to you, Martin, for... Uh, um, um, engaging with uh, Roberto Grandi and the very idea of uh, cultural welfare, maybe from a uh, well, from your from your experience, uh, Roberto. Um, uh, Martin, Roberto. Uh, uh, Professor Roberto Grandi doesn't need any <laughs> particular uh, motivation to explain uh, uh, what he means to say about that because it is as there's been his job, in large part. So, what can we say about cultural welfare? Uh, it was very interesting what, uh, what uh, Sarah and Dan uh, told us, uh, and I agree with what they told us. I think that uh, it's not necessary to create a new definition, but I would like to talk about uh, some basic question, very basic question, if you want to try to carry on uh, a cultural welfare. So, uh, uh, from a practical point of view, uh, and not just uh, from uh, a theoretical point of view, that from a theoretical point of view, we know that we can do what we want. Nobody is uh, putting uh, borders. But when we are trying to realize uh, uh, cultural welfare, it's more difficult. So, uh, I think that, um, uh, the, the, the first point is, uh, in my opinion, uh, to understand the reason why a large part of population have no access to uh, cultural events, to cultural products, etc. This, I think, that it's uh, the first point uh, from a, a sociological point of view, if you want. And, uh, you have to analyze which are the causes, because these are different from uh, one community to another community, to one uh, target, to one uh, uh, cluster, to another one. And uh, I think that uh, uh, this is the first point. And uh, there are a lot of uh, different causes, different motivation, that are in uh, some uh, uh, semiotic frame. They are economic, they are social, they are cultural, they are generational, gender, and so on. So, what happened? That uh, these uh, variables, uh, these uh, uh, motivation, in a way they build a physical or more interesting, a symbolic barrier between the cultural event or the possibility to take part to cultural event and the excluded individual and communities. For this reason, I think that the cultural institution must not only open the doors, because usually we say we become transparent, we open the door. But you open the door to whom? Mm -hmm. If they are excluded, they don't come to you. They are always the same that are coming to to you, in your room. So, the problem is uh, not just open the door, but to go out, to go out, to go where 
these individuals and these communities excluded by cultural uh, uh, fruition, <coughs> uh, consuming, uh, are. You have to go, you have to go there. And uh, this is the first point, to go out, to go where these people are. And if you are able, you can also reach that they will come to you. But what you have to do is to go out. The second point is uh, the relation between uh, the uh, artistic artifact uh, and uh, those people who are excluded to its uh, fruition. And uh, I think that it's not enough to go out, because you go out and to do, to do what? So what is necessary? It's uh, to have uh, a strong, uh, a strong uh, activities to create uh, cultural mediators. Cultural mediators means uh, that they can understand the local situation and to see if the causes of exclusion are economic, social, cultural, intercultural, uh, generational, gender, etc. And so they can work outside on these uh, uh, precise uh, uh, variables and try to, uh, 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 to have these uh, uh, individuals, uh, this community going uh, uh, close to some artistic laboratory or what you what you want to do from a different point of view but from my point of view the most important point is that in our society i think that there is not the perception that the welfare need cultural welfare. <laughs> you can read on, uh, on paper. I remember that uh, in the 72 I was working for the Council of Europe we were talking about decentralization and to have a culture to go outside where there are the fragile uh, uh, people etc. In 72, now we are uh, in 2021, and there is not this culture. What, what I mean that there is not this culture? That uh, the people, when they are talking about welfare, they are usually thinking uh, about, uh, about the life, the, the longevity of a population. If there is a longevity of population, we reach uh, what we want. Cultural welfare means uh, that the longevity, it's not enough. There is a problem of a quality of life. It's better to live five years less, but a good life, than to spend the last five times of your life in the solitude without any kind of relation and nothing. So this is another point about the quality. And uh, this uh, has to be... Uh, uh, and this is something that the decision makers need to do. Because at this point, they will promote some public cultural events or some cultural project on this topic. So I can, I can close this short remark. Remember the slogan. Of the, that you know very well, of the women textile workers in Lawrence, Massachusetts. In, you remember in, 12, in 1912, and it was bread and roses. Cultural welfare must bring roses which are as necessary as bread. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Uh, th thank you, thank you, Roberto. Thank you, Roberto, for pointing out the culture as a strategic factor for life quality. For life quality. And um, Martin, Martin. I'll, uh, again, I'll uh, stick with you and uh, Roberto and Fabiola to start up the second merry-go-round. Uh, we intended to uh, 
um, provide some uh, examples, as uh, Fabiola already did. So some example um, practices. Uh, so to explore the, the idea of cultural welfare from a practical perspective. And so, um, Martin, what's your uh, take? And then I'll, uh, maybe Fabiola and Roberto again can provide us some examples. And then we go back to Toronto. Of course, uh, we will probably to be talking a lot about including the excluded, uh, uh, involving the excluded. Uh, but uh, I'm sure that after uh, having heard uh, uh, Fabiola Naldi talking about the skin of the city, we want to know uh, uh, something more, uh, something more about what art can do for uh, for the city beside uh, intervening on the skin. Oh, <laughs> the, the skin of the city for a particular kind of artist is uh, like a canvas. Uh, but it depends uh, if uh, this canvas is uh, uh, permitted or not, is legal or not. Because if we think about uh, public art uh, project, and if we think about the public art project constructed with the major of the city, with the city, with the museum, it's quite normal to find this uh, new skin in, in, uh, in confronted with the museum or things like that. But if we think about artists that use the skin of the city away from the institution in some, in some point uh, of a discussion, uh, so it's, it's more difficult. Uh, and if we think about uh, the young generation and the possibility for the young generation of artists that use this skin in a different way, and I'm talking about the multimedia possibility for them to not just to paint or to sculpture or to draw, but we have a lot of more possibilities now. So we are talking about, if we think about, for example, the, the installation of Thomas Hirschham, for example, with the post monument <laughs> of the Gramsci monument in New York, and we think about the possibility to create a new kind of relation. And where Roberto uh, talked about uh, the mediation, the, the, the most important aspect for our responsibility as a museum to go outside and not just to create the, the, the occasion for the citizen to open, to find the, the, the door open, but to find people that can create a connection between the open door, the content inside the museum, and all the things that happen probably in, in some uh, uh, natural way in the city. Okay, so uh, it, it depends what kind of point of view. Uh, um, I know uh, what Roberto talked about because we were together in these years <laughs> now to, to think about the city, to think about the, the rule of a museum, to think about the, the rule of the institution, the public institution inside the city. But we were uh, very focused on the rule of our institution uh, next to the citizen, every kind of target of a citizen. So it's very important to... to not, as Roberto said, not just to open the door, but to think about uh, uh, the way that that door are probably more open outside of a museum than inside of a museum. So especially for the artist, uh, this uh, um, dialogue that we are having now is very simple because they, are out, they, they go outside, uh, they use the skin, uh, in some illegal way, some way, <laughs> and it's very dangerous because the Italian law is not so um, comfortable with this kind of attitude. But at the same time, uh, our responsibility is to create new connection confronting the legal and the illegal part and the mediation between this kind of project and the natural and independent way to use the city is just uh, probably the new rule for the mediator, for the curator, for the president of new kind of institution, especially in Italy, because our skin is very different. Uh, our skin is very old <laughs> in some way, and we have to protect that skin. But at the same, and we have to conserve that skin. But at the same time, if we don't uh, go farther and we don't think about the future, the young generation don't want to protect that kind of skin anymore. And they create a new conflict. 
And that's because, especially in the illegal part, writing, street art, urban practices are so natural now. And they create a new discussion, especially old and young generation in some way. Okay. Paolo, uh, I wonder if your uh, host, uh, if your guests have uh, something to specify about public space. What do they intend when they're talking about public space? Uh, belonging to whom, uh, where, and uh, in inside, outside the, the center of the city? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, may, it may be a, an important subject uh, uh, to add uh, to the conversation. Oh, thank you, Martin. Thank you, Martin, definitely. And I think uh, the, this is a perfect... Uh, a link to our second medical round because um, uh, I'm sure um, Sarah and Dan will provide some practical examples on uh, on that. So I'll turn uh, back over to, to Sarah. Oh, here you are. And um, so I have some, um, I hear some noise. Okay. All right. I hear some noise uh, in, in, in the room. Okay. Um, Sarah, I had some, you sent me some um, slides, so it would be it would be great to share some of your, some of your slides and uh, most importantly your projects, your uh, your uh, practical perspectives to address uh, Martin's question and to address uh, the uh, topic of cultural welfare from a practical uh, from practical lens. So, uh, Sarah, I'll, I'll put on the slides and then. Uh, we are all ears. Sounds great. And um, I'm going to set the slides up before we actually go through them one by one. Um, but um, Roberto, I loved your comments about inclusion. And, um, you know, in my in my research and my practice, I'm very much engaged with urban planning and particularly data driven planning and you know, thinking also about, uh, so looking at where cultural resources are located in relation to communities. Um, but also redefining cultural vitality. So really looking at extant culture. Uh, and I think you'll see this when I, I start to talk about um, uh, Artworks TO, but you know, not assuming that communities that are not connected with major public institutions are um, bereft of culture. And in fact, you know, the conversation around graffiti and street art that you've been having from the Bologna perspective is, is an illustration of that. In fact, they're often rich with culture, but culture that isn't supported institutionally. Um, so there's a sort of concept of planning with culture. So this idea that one ensures that there's flexible spaces that are accessible throughout a city for cultural practices that are appropriate to that site, that environment, um, and making cultural access possible for populations that are historically excluded, certainly also bringing the included <laughs> to those spaces and the excluded into other spaces. So. Um, you know, arts and cultural activities allow people to contemplate social issues, and those really do allow individual and groups, particularly those dealing with trauma, and this has been an incredibly important conversation in Canada around Indigenous truth and reconciliation, you know, also with, with Black populations dealing with um, intensified racism, but to bring a kind of healing and, and reconciliation. And then the other concept I, I just want to introduce before I talk about public art in Toronto is the idea of planning for well-being. So this idea that you integrate helpful design and arts resources into communities and you think about care and wellness as a kind of broader understanding of human engagement. So um, trust, mental health, joy, aesthetic pleasure, sharing, community safety, um, which is really important and public art and public space can play a really incredible role there, life affirmation, and as I said, healing. So that sort of sets up a little bit about um, thinking about public art in Toronto. So Toronto has a really significant history of public art. So j just to set that context, um, this includes a street art program that is well distributed throughout the city. Uh, mon monuments, which are both in uh, the extended suburbs, but also in the downtown core, and a lot of permanent works by really, really well-recognized international artists that are funded by developers, by a 1% kind of tax on them for air rights that are concentrated in the downtown of, of the city. We Blanche, and I chair that event. It's uh, now uh, been going on since 2006, and it's a 12-hour festival. Uh, it was concentrated in the downtown core. It's now also in, in Scarborough, and, and it brings out 1.4 million people. 
So the context where Dan and I and our colleagues um, decided to develop the report, Rethinking Public Art in Toronto, um, came from a dissatisfaction, a sense of um, you know, limitations with the public art practice in the city, the sense, and I think you're alluding to this, that more and more spaces where public art was positioned were actually private spaces for public art. You know, they're owned by developers, they're not accessible always. Um, but also uh, the idea that the kind of digital space is also a private space. So how do you open up that context for intervention and experience? And we've heard some Francesca just talked about that a little bit. Um, and then, you know, the idea that public space itself is increasingly regulated, uh, you know, and monitored. So it's not, it's not, a, it's not a, a safe space. And also that communities don't have access if they're outside the downtown core. Transit is very expensive in Toronto. So our report um, really shook up what we thought should happen in Toronto in terms of public art. We argued that Public art should be everywhere in the city. It should cross all media. It should be virtual as well as physical. It should be temporary as well as permanent. We said that commissioning processes and artists selected needed to be inclusive, that the city itself should invest 1% of its budgets in all of its new builds and infrastructure planning. That's a lot of money. And that we should keep the developers 1%. But we also identified other sources of investment. So. Um, you know, through political processes, <laughs> um, we got the report taken up by the city. We forced the report into the city. This was an external report that came to the city and the city itself um, welcomed the report <laughs> and it went through a political process. Um, so the city itself uh, undertook its own strategic planning and Dan and I were involved in that, but more in a peripheral way. And they came up with a 10 year public art strategy. The mayor to his credit, was very excited about our recommendations. And as part of our report, we suggested basically to his, his staff that they kick off the new strategy with a year of public art. And uh, the mayor, when he ran for his reelection, actually put that in his platform, which was courageous. Um, and uh, he was elected <laughs> and we began to plan this year of public art. And uh, it became Artworks TL. I was asked to co-chair it by the mayor. And it is really, I describe it um, essentially as the rehearsal for the 10-year strategy. It is a very radical strategy for a public art event. So let's start to go through some of the images, like go to the next image, and I'll, I'll kind of set up what we're doing. Um, so it kicked off uh, on September 22nd of this year. It was delayed for over 18 months because of COVID-19 and people not being able to be in public spaces together. Um, so the, the uh, city itself put in $5 million. Um, I've uh, co -led, well, led the fundraising efforts um, you know, with a professional team and we've raised another $6 million. So it's an $11 million 12 month project. And it's now completely integrated into recovery for the city. So I think this is very exciting. Economic recovery, social recovery, sense of identity, sense of being on the street safely. And um, the developer community, to their credit, has put in a lot of resource and money to this and has, you know, as have foundations and philanthropists. So what are its characteristics? Um, art blocks, um, a website that brings together all of the existing public art an artist in residency program, 1,400 new works by artists, which is incredible um, if you think about it. And then the art being distributed throughout the city of Toronto, an artist in residency program with the city of Toronto and one that is well-funded, um, you know, one that is with um, our incredible parks program and another um, in the building of a new courthouse. Um, and then we're bringing in Philadelphia's Monument Labs that Ken Lum leads, uh, you know, is looking at um, what exists right now in terms of Toronto's monuments and how can they be rethought and re-understood. Um, and then um, a whole series of co-building measures. So with communities, engagement throughout the city, with arts organizations and with arts groups, many of them are in Black and uh, racialized communities throughout the city and with Indigenous communities as well. And um, over 95% of the artists are Black, Indigenous, or artists of color, recent immigrant communities who are 
partaking in that 1400 number. So it really represents the diversity of Toronto. I cannot underscore how right Dan is in the kind of communities that the city represents. And the artworks are challenging. You know, they're not easy works. Um, uh, but so far, the public has really embraced them. We've got over 50 art walks where you can make your way through the city with a guide or a digital platform or augmented reality, which is a big part of it. So, uh, you know, one of my favorite projects is an augmented reality um, river that flows with the memories of those who've lost their families and friends to COVID. So the images that you're seeing, um, the first one was a new, new mural by Micmac artist Jordan Bennett. Um, that's at my university's Butterfield Park, which is a big kind of public space. Um, the one that you're seeing now is called Generally Speaking, and it's by New York artist Nina Chanel Abney, and she looks at representation and abstraction. She is very interested in the frenetic pace of contemporary culture, but she's also very interested in anti-Black racism and action against this. And this mural is in the wealthiest part of Toronto, in Yorkville. Um, Sacred Fire, which is the next image, um, which will, is, will go into High Park, and it's based on the Seven Fires Prophecy which is 1,200 years old, about looking at community balance and well-being by, by Philip Cote, um, who's uh, an alum from Okadu. And then uh, the last, the next image is called The Brotherhood of Fubo, For Us and By Us. And it's at the West End, and it's massive. It's massive, and it, it kind of fronts um, Lake Ontario. And it's a photo uh, installation by Esma Mahoumad, who's... Um, actually also an Okadu alum, um, whose career has really taken off um, in the art world. She's an African-Canadian artist. And it, it's about ideas about Black ma masculinity. And then the last image is really important because it represents the other dimension, which is that there's um, community hubs, public art hubs, created by um, emerging um, curators from uh, people of color, recent immigrant communities, these brilliant curators. And this is called Chasm e Bulbul, um, and it's out in Bayview Village. Uh, and it's it's a number of artists who are looking at the South Asian um, Sikh community experience through the lens of women. Um, so, but there's there's seven of these hubs that are distributed throughout the city, and the art is everywhere. So this is really an intervention, you know. Um, and I think Dan and I are very proud that we wrote a public policy piece as academics. And through, I think, you know, good uh, sort of stick handling, it actually has created somewhat of a revolution in terms of public art in the city of Toronto. We're not going to go back. It's not going to be the same, but it's going to be really, really excellent of international quality and it will be a magnet for tourism. So there's a whole economic dimension to this, as well as the incredibly inspiring quality of the artists and the work that they're doing. Thank you, Sarah. And your presentation actually inspired, inspired, and provided the extent of that uh, diversity, right? That, that really makes uh, Toronto unique. The genius of uh, Toronto and its diversity. I like to say that diversity is the mother of creativity, right? So the more diverse we are, the more creative uh, we can uh, we can be. And uh, the projects you have uh, just shared with us are really uh, speak to that uh, diversity as the mother of creativity. And, um, and I'm sure that Dan uh, and, uh, his uh, experience uh, between uh, Toronto and Chicago, working on uh, different cities, uh, uh, I'm sure you have some good best practices to share with us mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the impact that arts and culture can have on, uh, on well-being. Sure, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's inspiring to see what Sarah was just, uh, just showing to us because it really... Our report was the, the, the motto of the report was public art everywhere. And uh, to take that motto, which you know has a long pedigree uh, in the philosophy and social theory I was talking about before, and it inspired, for example, the the uh, the uh, the New Deal response to the depression um, in the 1920s and 19 in the 30s, um, being given new life now in the 21st century and to update that for the present is just exciting to see that the city and all of these people who have worked together are willing to take that risk to do it. Um, I think uh, a couple of things are worth adding to that. Uh, one is that when we talk about including the excluded, uh, I think we can think about how to do that also in the sense of the categories that we use to um, identify growth and change in the cultural domain. Um, when we look at, for example, the categories that governments use often, 
uh, for example, in the U.S., the National Endowment for the Arts, they would use the traditional categories, opera, you know, symphony, the, it's, uh, theater, and so on. And sometimes they would see declines in cultural activity. Uh, but as soon as you open up those categories to the whole range of ways in which everyday people uh, explore, utilize the arts in their lives, then you see incredible growth. And that's, of course, a kind of political act to change those categories or to open them up. But that's what's necessary to actually get a read on what's happening and provide the opportunities for not just, so to speak, physically to go from the included to the excluded, and, and but also in terms of the categories that we use to even identify those things. Now, there is changes happening in those directions, and I know that's happening in a number of ways, but we can do that as well. And that's, of course, again, from a sociological point of view, the categories that we use to define things are really important. So I think that's one thing uh, that we can think about a lot as a best practice. But I'm going to come down to the ground a little more, and I'll talk uh, about... Um, some things I've been involved in at a kind of more everyday level. I mean, Sarah laid out what we've done together really well, so I won't add to that. Um, back that I think are really good best practices. So I, I was involved in something in Chicago that is called the fiscal, that was called the Fiscal Austerity and Urban Innovation uh, Program. And that was a program that was, uh, that came out of the period of fiscal austerity in the early, in the 1980s, where there wasn't a lot of money around in cities. And cities were trying to figure out how to uh, cultivate various kinds of innovation in a relatively inexpensive way. And one thing that we did in that role capacity in the state of Illinois coming out of Chicago was we would um, offer little prizes. These are little best practices that I think go a long way. We would offer little prizes to uh, cities and communities that, would, uh, that were doing something interesting in some way. And the prizes didn't have a lot of monetary value, but they were kind of like those, you know, laurels that would go around your head when you win something in the Olympics. And people would get very proud of that. And just offering a little prize for some program that might you might not think of or hear about allows those practices to spread around. So some of the ones that we, that we came out of that kind of program, just little prizes for small towns in Illinois. Uh, there was a town that uh, purchased just flower flower seeds and would hand out the seeds to residents and residents would gather together, plant the flowers, uh, cultivate the flowers. They would do it in public spaces, in uh, the, the dividers between streets. And together they worked to beautify their towns. And these were towns where uh, they were bleeding population, people were moving out. And just this is one step in turning it into a place where people wanted to be and stay. Other towns would do things like uh, open up their public spaces, like their libraries, uh, their, um, their government offices, even very boring places like the you know, the, 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 where you go to get your driver's license. Um, and they would uh, say, anybody who's got some kind of work they would like to present, you can present it in there. Um, and what you find is that there's all sorts of people with creativity and talent that is just sitting there waiting for someone to tap them on the shoulder and say, yes, we want you to show what you can do. And I took that idea when I moved to Toronto, uh, I started a festival in Toronto called the Art of the Danforth. The Danforth Avenue is one of the main arteries on the east side of the city. Um, and uh, I, I looked at my data and I could see that there were all sorts of artists and other creative people living in that area, but there wasn't a lot of uh, public uh, opportunities for people to uh, display what they were doing. And we got together and we got a group together and we would go up and down the local businesses on the, on the streets. And we would go into the businesses and um, ask them if they were willing to be a be a venue to exhibit and show the works of people from around the neighborhood. But then we'd also advertise to people all over the city. And we made a, a purposeful goal to not only go into the kinds of businesses that you might think would be interested in showing art, like a cafe or a fancy restaurant. We would go into pizza places. We would go into exterminators. We would go into plumbers. <laughs> and, and once you talk to people, they're interested in doing it, but not many people just go in and ask them. And, uh, uh, and, and that was the sort of uh, uh, beginning of our kind of festival that we created that was designed to try to use these kind of innovative new ways. And that's what got me interested in these kinds of things that we ended up doing with Sarah uh, in a way to scale up that sort of possibility to a much larger way. So I, I think that kind of back and forth between, you know, people on the ground experimenting what's with what works and then turning it into scaled up policies that can then ignite other places in that same model. 
Thank you. Thank you, Devin. It's so inspiring that um, um, academic research uh, can uh, foster uh, public and uh, civic engagement. So somehow your data, your uh, researchers, your analysis eventually uh, help it out to, to foster this kind of uh, initiatives. I like to call it a kind of applied research in the field of uh, cultural, uh, cultural uh, uh, management and cultural uh, welfare applied research where research can be re can really be integrated with the, the, the urban fabric with the um, with the social uh, social environment and so great great uh, examples and i think uh, sara this is also what uh, ocad university did right so for maybe from bologna they are not familiar with ocad stands for uh, uh, ontario college of arts that it then became a university so that that's why we call it ocad u ocad university University. And, um, and I pointed out the, the idea of a university of imagination because I think um, the role OCAD uh, plays in the very downtown Toronto, in the middle of, of the city, is to, uh, again, uh, step out of the university and into the city, right? To really engage with, uh, with the, urban, uh, the urban contest, right? So what's, and you have been running OCAD for 10, 10 uh, years. <laughs> And so what's the role of the, um, well, somehow the University of Bologna is just right in the city of Bologna. The city of Bologna and the university are one and together since, uh, well, a few centuries, I think. And so what's the role that um, academic institutions uh, like uh, OCAD in the city of Toronto can really play to foster this kind of uh, integrated applied research? Do you want me to start? I'm happy yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, briefly because I'm conscious of time. Yeah, yeah, okay. And so, then we are going to open up the floor to discussion. Okay. So. Yeah, no, no, for sure. So um, let me talk, speak on a number of levels. So I was president for 15 years. So I did a lot of, um, you know, capital planning, right, which presidents do. And my strategy was to kind of take the spine of OCAD University, which it has a very famous um, building designed by Will Alsop, who sadly is no longer alive, but he's an amazing British architect, which galvanizes tourists in Toronto. So every tour bus goes by and it's, it. We're up on stilts and it's a beautiful building. Um, but we actually have 14 buildings now, actually 15, and we're about to have another one. Um, and my strategy was to kind of spread, to disperse the university. So our students, our faculty, throughout this kind of spine and then down to the waterfront, because we're now on Toronto's beautiful waterfront in, a, in an arts focused incubator environment. Um, and we're going out west again now. We've got a new initiative. But the and the idea um, was to also work with developers who've provided us space. So we've done that now. We're about, about to do it yet another time. So we've done that about three or four times. So to build these sort of alliances so we could get our students out into the world, you know, um, because really like so much of the training at the university is not just about individual creativity, but during my tenure as president, it was very much about working collaboratively, working in communities, working in a deeply, deeply um, interdisciplinary way uh, with other universities, but, you know, we do a lot of work with industry um, and really teaching students how to use the tools of art and design to solve what we would describe as wicked problems or grand challenges. Um, so we are, you know, our students are part of the Artworks TO, uh, the recent, the current president who's wonderful, Anna Serrano, started something called Big Art TO, you know, which is um, projections of, um, of artworks, the student work, right through to people like Philip Beasley, who's a super famous Canadian architect artist. Um, our students are very involved in something called the City Lab, uh, which is an initiative by the City of Toronto, which is looking at wellness and how to use exactly what we're talking about, you know, art and design in the context of urban recovery and wellness. Um, our, our faculty and students are working with public health to look at um, why so many communities were excluded um, you know, from appropriate um, support during COVID-19 and how to correct that, how to everything from data collection to communication. And we have some really important research in that space. Um, we have a very strong focus on inclusive design, which is really designing for people of all disabilities and um, our institution's part of a really, really interesting project. It's, it's, a, it's a big project, which is um, 
called a pathway to, to realizing the sustainable development goals in post-secondary education. So it's looking at how to ensure that students with disabilities and others at the margins can access post-secondary education. And all of this is about kind of taking that deep historic tradition, which we started with, you know, um, that comes from design, that comes from the best of art practices, and looking at how one leverages that into 21st century practice. So we're very strong on computation. People don't think about that as an art and design school. You know, we've got uh, Canada Research Chairs and Internet Design for the Internet of Things and Design for Health. Um, um, so we're kind of bringing together those capacities as well, but we're also not shy about collaborating, you know, with colleagues at, you know, University of Toronto, York University, Ryerson, and well beyond because, you know, building these interdisciplinary coalitions and making them work. For me as president, that was one of my major, major drivers, you know, um, because I think that's where things really change. And we're very good at engaging communities at Okeju. Like yeah. we really, yeah. really have reached out and reached in and pulled out. So our students come from those communities. Our faculty come from those communities. Um, I led three cluster hires, you know, Indigenous cluster hires, groups of Indigenous faculty, and a Black cluster hire. And it has transformed the university, you know? Um, and and we, we had a policy of hiring Indigenous and racialized faculty, and we did it. We truly, truly did this. And our deans, uh, you know, our deans are all either people of color or Indigenous. So um, this is a big dimension of our conversation is about equity and representation and the role and the responsibility of institutions to, to include and speak for the communities where they're located. Yeah, this is wonderful. This is a really speaks to the idea that uh, uh, higher education is a really a, a, an ongoing community building exercise, right? The, the glue of the uh, uh, of, um, of our communities that gather together uh, thanks to the role played by academic institutions. And I'm sure that, uh, in, well, resonating uh, these um, ideas and the role played by OCAD, U of T um, and the School of, uh, the School of Cities at, uh, at U of T is deeply engaged in this uh, community building exercise. So I think uh, is a is a global trend in uh, um, academic universities right to really somehow not just think about the global dimensions of globalizing the university brand but having an impact on the actual uh, context the urban context i i usually like to joke a little bit on the university of toronto and we should uh, rename it the University for Toronto. That uh, that little word will make uh, will make a huge difference to conceive the University for for Toronto. But the many universities and colleges in Toronto are actually on the same uh, on the same page. So they are all really committed to yeah to, to build the idea of the universities in the twenty first uh, first centuries. And, and and again, so combining innovation and tradition. The oldest university in the world, the uh, University of Bologna, for sure, has something to say on, on, on that always, through the centuries, uh, uh, in a century old tradition, always engaging, actually engaging the city. I think, Roberto, uh, have you be, uh, there was a, um, a minister uh, in, uh, in Bologna, in the city of Bologna, municipality of Bologna, a minister of uh, university affairs. So there was an assessore. Uh, um, appointed for fostering relationships, I think, between the university and and uh, and the city, right? Uh, I can say something uh, uh, related to uh, to what uh, Sarah said, uh, because it's but uh, it seems to me that it's three years more or less or four maybe that uh, university and uh, municipality build. Uh, a, an office or a department that it's called the civic imagination. So it doesn't work like a uh, university of imagination in uh, Toronto, but uh, has uh, a similar feeling. So the feeling it's just to work uh, outside the institutions, of course, uh, and uh, uh, to put together uh, students and uh, other people working uh, for municipality. So I think that uh, it could be interesting uh, to put uh, 
uh, encountered uh, these two uh, different realities because uh, uh, thinking about uh, civic imagination, it's uh, uh, to work uh, on uh, the same field that uh, Sarah was talking uh, uh, about uh, before. Yes, Paolo, I, I, I believe that uh, just I would be interesting to bring back our uh, guest uh, to, to an important topic of uh, the Italian Association of Canadian Studies that is always not only to limit our uh, discussion to an academic level but also to try to implement, uh, actually to foster innovation, uh, trying to, uh, to have in occasion similar to this uh, the possibility of join forces and try to see if we can uh, if we can do something something new uh, this is one of the topic i would really like to 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 discuss before the the, the evening uh, winds uh, winds down and uh, the second uh, topic is inevitable considering the the what's going on what has been the, uh, the recent uh, lockdown and the present status of affairs in, in, because of the pandemic done to, uh, in respect to the, the public art uh, uh, and the, the use of public spaces to, uh, uh, to overcome the, the, uh, the, 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 the problem created by the pandemic? Maybe, uh, we can say something okay, from Bologna. Yeah, uh, yeah we, uh, I have an example of something that could be done. I, I, I would like to remember that for 10 months, the museum, public library, university, they closed. So uh, there was no possibility to go uh, to uh, and theater, and cinema, etc. So at this point, uh, the problem is that uh, what you can do from the point of view of your social responsibility as a public museum. You cannot work in this case with the communities because the communities has not the possibility to go in public space. So what at our Museum of Modern Art, Mambo, Modern Art Museum of Bologna did, we were thinking that the museum has a social responsibility not only towards uh, community, individuals, etc., but also toward artists. And this is a good point because uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic period, artists and the creatives, uh, with the exception of the celebrities, but they are a little few, they were among the categories most affected by the crisis with the artists, of all kinds of artists, working with, uh, in theatre, etc. And they didn't have, at least in Italy, I don't know, in, uh, in Canada, safeguard clauses, or they had the possibility to get money from the government. So, this category had are really problems. If they have a gallery, they were not sure to keep the gallery at the end of a pandemic. If they were uh, doing and trying to sell what they were doing, there was no possibility in that time. And so many of them, they were in a really difficult. And so they did not know how to go on. So what uh, we did is something that I don't know why the other museum in the world didn't do. I mean, if you close your museum, you can close your museum, you don't pay people work in museum, you don't get money, you go to, you go to sleep, and after 10 months, you get up and you start again to do. What we do, it's uh, to think that if we have this uh, social responsibility towards uh, these uh, artists, we can do something more. 
in a very inexpensive way because there were no money, no funds. And so what we did, we switched the museum from the house or the home of uh, works of uh, uh, work, art, art. work art to the home of artists. So in our museum, we give the possibility to 14 young artists that were without studios to go for 10 months inside our museum and to spend time working together. They created the studios and we organized also public programs and some galleries went there to see what they were doing and so we created a community of young artists for 10 months. If you think how many museums all over the world were closed in that period, if you multiple the possibility, they were possibility for many, many young artists. They were artists from Bologna because at that time it was not possible to, no, to, 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 to change. To, and and uh, uh, we had 14, uh, uh, 14 possibilities place inside and uh, open space. It's an enormous open space, uh, our museum. And uh, there were more than 85 that asked to come and at the end we choose uh, 14 and uh, you see what, what Bologna is, but Toronto is the same. Of these 14, two were from Bologna. The other from uh, different countries, from uh, Africa, from, uh, uh, from uh, Mongolia and from other, uh, from the uh, United States, from other places. So it means that uh, at that point uh, you also uh, get the possibility to know that there are artists coming from all over the world, many of them studying at uh, 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 School of, uh, of Art in, uh, in, uh, in Bologna. And so, uh, uh, fr from my point of view, this is an example that sometimes you can carry on a project without money, but with an idea. And uh, thanks also to the uh, new technology, the idea is more important than money. You know, at, at the end you need money, but uh, uh, the idea is the starting point. So this uh, was a good example. It was the only possibility to keep uh, a museum open in a period where it was closed. So because the people couldn't go in. But you gave a lot of possibility to these young uh, uh, artists that now they are still working together, different groups. So you can help to create a new community just giving the space and giving them the opportunity to work together and to grow because our director, Fabiola, and curators, etc., have spent time there. And so this, in, in my opinion, is a good example of uh, how you can manage a crisis. Also, when you think there is no possibility to do something, if you are trying to think in a different way, in a different way, maybe you find a possibility. And this is a small, inexpensive example, but from a symbolic point of view, for us, was, uh, was, a, good, uh, was a good example with, uh, uh, with a good results. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah, thank yeah you. because we always think about the museum, and especially the public museum, as a factory. Yeah. As a factory. So it was our responsibility, not just for the citizen and for the tourists, for example, but also for the artist, to create a new connection between the museum and the occasion built by the museum. So we product new kind of art, 
uh, we, we buy with different kinds of supports uh, uh, the art, this artwork from this artist and uh, for us it was the occasion probably to, to rethink about the idea of the museum, especially now after pandemic, because we want to think about after pandemic, even if we are still inside the pandemic in some way, we have to think further and, and, and more about a new kind of museum, especially for the young generation. Can we imagine to do this for, uh, for cross purposes, to, to host uh, artists from, uh, from Canada and have a museum in Canada hosting uh, Italian or, or anyway, Bolognese in, uh, artists? In, in this period, we, have a we, we don't, don't inside yeah. museum, but in residence too. But uh, uh, another point that I don't say is that usually when you do this kind of activity, you ask the artist to leave, yeah. to leave the product to the museum. But we think that we have not to do so, because it's work. And so we helped them to sell. And so then, uh, 10 of them were selling to, uh, to a bank or to other institution. So, they started to, to work as a professional and we helped them, but we didn't keep yeah. the, uh, uh, the product of what they have done in museum because it's horrible. Don't, don't give money and uh, to keep uh, right. the work. The work. Uh, yeah. Before going, uh, giving back the, the, the floor to Toronto, I think that, uh, Fabiola, you started mentioning the, the differences between a city like Bologna, of course, and a city like uh, Toronto. Uh, going outside the museum into the, the public space of the city, uh, of a city like Bologna, yeah. who is already rich of work of arts, uh, what are the possibilities for artists to actually make a difference in the public space outside the museum? Um, I was thank you, Dan, because uh, you, you 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 talked about uh, John Dewey, and also for us, John Dewey has been very very important, especially in that old book like Artist Experience. And for us, still now, art is a really, really deep experience, especially in the public space. So uh, the, the young generation of artists now, especially in Bologna, and we think about the, the relationship between the public space, the university, and the Academy of Fine Art <coughs> that is inside the university district. And uh, uh, we, we have to think about this new connection because the public space are in some way the institution, the educational institution, but also the experience that can create between this kind of proposals. So for the young artists in Bologna, it's, it's quite easy to, to, to use the public space because uh, it's not a big town in some way, but at the same time, if we don't think about just writing street art or, or public art, but we think about different, for example, music and language and performance together. Uh, and, and so uh, the, the, the old city of Bologna uh, can transform itself in, in a sort of a, of a unique experience. And we are very good in this, <laughs> just for a long, long time. Uh, we think about the 70s, for example, and we normally uh, create new extra artistic or new uh, uh, multimedia experience uh, uh, in the public space with different kind of art. So for us, uh, uh, especially for Bologna, we have so many festivals, public dance, uh, no? uh, and not just about cinema or video art uh, or, or museum, but, but very different festivals deep inside the experience of the city. And we try to continue to, to do things like that. And uh, especially for the young generation, the city is very important, especially now that the city was closed. For us, the city has been, has been closed for, for more than a year. And it was impossible to, to have a walk after 10 o'clock in the night for a city for, oh, like Bologna, uh, to not be outside after it's, it's impossible. starting at the yeah beginning. at that yeah. time we start to leave so it's it's very difficult for us so um, now it's time to uh, rebuild 
the experience inside the public space. And uh, it's very difficult because we have seen, especially now, uh, with all the students from different kinds of countries and, uh, and cities, that the city is full of people. Uh, and and the, in this case, it's probably the occasion to, to create really new connection and, and, and new languages in the public space. Uh, wonderful, so, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. I, 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 well, I'm conscious of time, and so I wanted to, well, uh, thank you for, um, thank you, Roberto and Fabiola, for providing us um, a kind of answer, well, to the idea of uh, what, what, what are the lessons we are learning, right, in response to this global pandemic. So somehow, so there are many lessons we learned uh, uh, to rethink uh, the, the role of arts and culture in, in a post-pandemic world. So I, I like to um, go to the conclusion and ask for some final uh, brief uh, remarks uh, to Sara and Dan uh, exactly on, on, on the on this uh, same point. So what are the lessons uh, we can learn uh, out of this pandemic? So what are the most important uh, um, lessons that, uh, again, we can apply for uh, uh, looking uh, um, beyond the pandemic? Sara, I'll uh, turn over to you for, uh, again, some final remarks on the lessons we are learning. You know, I, I think it's huge. Um, you know, for one thing, we need to continue to look at the power of art uh, in terms of transforming people's lives and supporting, as I began my remarks, you know, mental health and, and wellness and um, also look at impact, analyze the impact of the arts and not just think it's only about aesthetics and pleasure, which are important, or debate, but this sort of holistic way of looking at impact. So I think we need ways of measuring impact. I have a new research project that's looking at kind of qualitative tools to understand impact, in, including on health and wellness. So I think we need to expand how we define, you know, the success of artwork, its, its, its um, value in the world, and we need public funding. So we need to continue, you know, to see the role of um, the public sector and, and partnerships beyond to make this possible. So, you know, that sort of, maybe that sounds like motherhood, but it, it's really basic. Um, I spend a fair amount of time with uh, cultural institutions talking about their digital strategies and, you know, what was before, what was during, what was after. And I think there's a deep transformation that is very exciting um, that was forced by the pandemic where uh, performing arts institutions, galleries, museums, arts fairs developed a qualitative leap forward in their digital programming. And they attracted new audiences. They attracted international audiences to local work. They were able to build hybrid audiences between you know, traditional audiences and new audiences. And I, I won't go into all of the ways that that has happened. And uh, there are actually really exciting business models that have come out of this that are successful. So it's not just about giving free content, you know, but it is about expanded access, including for people who have trouble accessing art and culture, um, you know, because of disabilities, et cetera, who can have amazing online experiences. So I'm very excited to see where this goes. Um, you know, we're already seeing a pattern where a lot of audiences want to go back to face to face, but others want to stay online and people are retaining their new audiences um, for really, really high quality work. You know, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, immersive experiences, great concerts, very intimate dance, uh, working with mobile phones and inspiring dances around the city. So I, I you know, I think we're going to also see, and we've already heard of it from our colleagues in Bologna, a big expansion of the work of the digital, you know, within public space. Um, but I think we're, I think it's a really exciting time now in terms of how we're going to manage the hybridity of the virtual and the physical, because mainstream institutions and small cultural institutions entered the space, and I don't think they're going to step away from it. Well put, well put. Very inspiring, and uh, yeah, we we really look forward to it. Daniel, your final remarks on the lessons we are learning uh, on cultural welfare. Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, clearly Sarah's just hit one of the big ones, which is the qualitative leap forward on digitization. Um, 
but so I'll speak to another one. And I think it has to do with this kind of theme we've been talking about, which is the healthy back and forth between sort of bottom up and top down or spontaneous emergence of new things and then trying to integrate those into planning in a creative way. One thing that happened early on in the uh, pandemic period here in Toronto, especially when lockdowns were more um, severe and public spaces were closed, is people started uh, just having music performances in on their porches all around the city. And when you happened upon one, it was just a beautiful experience just, just to be together with other people listening to music, some in your neighborhood or some you might just stumble upon walking around because that was the main activity you could do is walk around. And uh, that uh, has expanded since then. And now there's more formal programs that allow people to host concerts on their porches and they match people together, uh, sort of people who have a home and a porch uh, together with musicians. That's a very interesting development. It goes back to some of the early functions of porches and balconies as places where people would come out and give speeches and performances. And it creates a very interesting kind of liminal space between the private and the public. The other thing that's very interesting that started out sort of bottom up and now it's been more institutionalized is uh, there was a successful program here called Cafe TO where all along some of the major streets there was, uh, you could have uh, outdoor cafes and seating and dining that would take over uh, uh, parking spaces. And, and then that was matched with another program where the city would match up people who uh, businesses who had those outdoor activities going on with lists of musicians who could then come perform there. And that kind of matching process just vitalized streets here that just don't have a tradition of that kind of uh, buzzing outdoor activity that is more characteristic of many European cities. And I think that's the kind of thing that will stick. Like it, it involves loosening up some of the rules around, uh, you know, sound and noise after a certain uh, time. And I think people discovered that the sky didn't fall when we had music going on a little later at night and we had people uh, having performances on their porches. And I think we really learn to appreciate that. So I think that's one example. I'm working on a project right now with some music um, uh, promoters and operators around Toronto to just try to take the lessons that were learned and many of the innovations that came out of that sort of moment of necessity and see how we can we can institutionalize them and make them uh, happen over and over again now that we've learned to, how, much we, how much we appreciated them. Wonderful, wonderful. Well said, well said. And this, uh, with these words, I think uh, it's uh, finally time to wrap up. Uh, I wanted to say, first of all, to thank you again, all our partners, University of Bologna, University of Toronto, the Canadian Embassy in Rome, the Italian Cultural Institute, the School of Cities, and all the cultural and academic institutions that really supported the uh, uh, this uh, event uh, tonight. I wanted to thank you again, uh, our special guests, uh, Dan Silver, uh, Sarah Diamond from uh, Toronto, and Roberto Grandi and uh, Fabio Lanaldi from Bologna, my fellow co host, uh, Martin Stiglio, and all uh, the friends and colleagues and the Italian Association of uh, Canadian Studies. Uh, Martin, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll give you the room for one second to say hi from Bologna. So we get a little bit of a Bologna mood and attitude. We take it here to Toronto and hopefully we will be able to, to get together uh, again uh, in Toronto or Bologna. And we look forward to foster innovation and tradition together and possibly think uh, uh, um, a more sustainable, equitable, uh, and open world oh, under the yeah. banner of the cultural welfare we have been exploring today. So, so Martin, 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 give the word the for word some, some uh, uh, final, uh, final cheers from Bologna. Grazie Paolo. Uh, naturally, na naturally, I don't want to repeat all the, 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 the thanks that, uh, uh, that come, all, of course, also from our side. I would simply underline the, the extremely important activity that uh, this uh, conference of the Italian Association of Italian of Canadian Studies has, done, has had in uh, trying this innovative form of dialogue. We were discussing before with, uh, uh, with our uh, guest how functional has been uh, this possibility to uh, interact and to and to speak and of course 
is uh, I, I, I tend to repeat myself, but I would really like to see coming something practical out uh, uh, of this evening. We have uh, in Bologna many people who actually uh, work in the field of uh, public art. We have many institutions, very old institutions, and uh, like uh, we saw, we have people working in this institution with the best motivation. I'm sure, because I know the, 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 the situation in Toronto very well for having uh, worked there for many years, that the situation is uh, the same in Toronto. So let's hope that maybe we also with the help of uh, the Italian Association of Canadian Studies, we may actually bring along uh, 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 new developments, new programs, uh, both for uh, young artists but also for uh, uh, established artists in for the benefit of uh, of the welfare of our two cities and two countries thank you again for uh, for uh, your contribution thank you thank you thank you everyone, thank you, everyone. Uh, bye, bye, bye 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 it was a great pleasure thank you thank you